Hello. So, what is photogrammetry? I'll tell you what it isn't though, it isn't in my spell checker, which is crazy considering that photogrammetry was conceived in 1851, the same era as photography itself. It was used for the purpose of map making and surveying, but it wouldn't really come through until the late 20th century. So the process of photogrammetry is pretty simple, yet it's like magic. You can take a bunch of photographs of an object or an environment, and produce extremely dense 3D point clouds from this. How it does it is it distinguishes similar features between similar photographs. So with the event of graphics cards recently in the last five, 10 years, we've seen a rapid rise in this. The GPU acceleration that we've had offered is unbelievable. So where, we're, where we were struggling with this, uh, 10 years ago, we could only do a few million points of detail, and it would take months of processing time with a few hundred photographs. Now we're going to do tens of billions in days with thousands of photographs. And so the big problem is, how do you manage all this data? Because the problem is simple. Traditional means take minutes, if not hours, to render a single frame, and we need to see this in real time. So we developed basically an ultra-realistic, sorry, a real-time ultra-realistic visualization methodology to get all this amazing point cloud data of these amazing environments live, so you can feel it, so you can see it. And so we call it single pass photogrammetry. Photogrammetry for lazy people. <laughs> <laughs> so, the benefits of this are pretty clear. You get immediate response, immediate gratification of these scenes. Um, and it's the level of detail we're able to retain as a result of this. You can get right up, see every paint stroke, every nook and cranny. And in real time, with real time lighting, the whole lot, it benefits everything. And once again, level of detail. We haven't lost a thing. We do not lose a single thing in this process. We retain all those tens and hundreds of billions of points, and we get it running on real time on a standard desktop PC or mobile web browser. So, what makes us different from the competition is the perfection of imperfection. Shimmer and shine. The fact that the way wood reflects on a wooden um, varnished floor or the way that carpet is, or the, you know, rocks or whatnot. It's, it's, it's these levels of lighting imperfections that really create the sense of immersion, which then creates a sense of retention. So yeah, R&D is really a big thing here. We're constantly trying to make ourselves obsolete. This is how we've managed to keep years ahead of the competition in regards to detail, in regards to the imperfection of perfection. So locations we've done. <coughs> Uh, Nefertari, Queen Nefertari in the Valley of the Queens, Tutankhamun, King Tut, that was fun, uh, Carmack, new local sites like, uh, oh sorry, CERN, Large Hydrogen Collider, my gosh, uh, got to go 100 metres underground, got to roll around a little bit of radiation, uh, it was kind of scary, <laughs> like why am I here, how did I get here? Um, but yeah, so that was, uh, we've done amazing sites in New Zealand as well, uh, New Zealand Parliament, the Treaty of Waitangi, uh, which was quite frankly an honour. Uh, the homestead, Sir James Wallace, beautiful, beautiful place that you saw before. Uh, bragging rights, well, we consider the gold standard, quite simply. Uh, sure. <laughs> uh, How did I get here again? Um, but yeah, Forbes have covered us a few times. Uh, other parties, you know, NVIDIA and all that, they love us. But look, guys, that's enough of the bragging rights. So, let me paint you a happy slice of life, a moment in time, a memory. I was literally the epitome of living the urban lifestyle. Extremely house proud, had had this home for eight and a half years, renovated it myself, went on YouTube, learned how to do it all, sanded the floors the whole lot. You know, 100 square metres, amazing place in the centre city. I was a drummer and a singer in a band, if anyone hadn't guessed that already, but <laughs> um, proud father to a beautiful daughter and my loving partner, Chantal. It was... The morning after my 31st birthday party, uh, we woke up to flames coming through, howling through our skylight window, uh, and we knew exactly what had happened. We lost the home. The whole place was gutted. <sighs> Chantal had ran through the flames and rescued adjacent neighbours, and it was reported in all the local papers. Now, she was on a student allowance, and I was on the invalid's benefit. We both lost our benefit the next day because we were reported as a couple. And that's not apparently okay in current law. 
I then lost custody a few days after that, after a five-year a five year court hearing I had set, got thrown out because I had no home. Chantal and me broke up a month later. Sometime later, she took her own life. So, I'm just going to say this. We have a broken safety net in New Zealand. We have the highest OECD rate of any youth suicide rate in the world. It's not okay. When we were down, we got kicked down further. That was not okay. But how do you make do? How do you move on? You either get busy living or you get busy dying, right? So I developed post-traumatic stress disorder, as one can imagine, and all the lovely faults that come with it. Um, I would always have these reoccurring dreams, every night, for years, of returning home. And they weren't negative dreams. They were dreams like, dreams of just feeling sanctuary. And so I, I just got this crazy obsession. How do I get back to the house? How do me and my daughter return home? I'd read that the US military had uh, used VR and MDMA, <laughs> actually, to deal with soldiers in Iraq who had gone through traumatic situations, where they basically reinforced negative memories with positive memories. Cool, let's give it a go. <laughs> so 2008, I discovered this, I remember watching this amazing talk, TED Talk, Photosynth, and this was the precursor of photogrammetry. And I knew I'd had eight and a half years of family photographs. And so I was like, well, why don't I just use all my family photographs to recreate my house? Let's see if it's, it's doable. So come 2015, when this technology was really maturing, it was like magic, absolute magic. So I wasn't classically trained, apart from my Commodore Amiga in 1989. Thank you, Mum. Honestly, changed my life. I'm an Amiga boy. Uh, and so that's the only experience I'd actually had as a, as, a, as a kid playing with 3D packages. I had no idea what I was doing. So I didn't know what rules I was breaking. All I knew is that I needed to get from A to B. I needed to get from here to here. Didn't bother, did not want to be stuck in this traditional 20-year-old 20 20 year VFX pipeline. And so my process was unorthodox. First scene we did, alleyway, uh, 2015, this just <laughs> took the internet by storm. I look at it now, I cringe, but hey. But you know, it's really funny. Alleyways and shoes, for us photogrammetrists, seem to be really a rite of passage. I have no idea why. We always, always seem to gravitate towards this. And yeah, following board became huge, ended up traveling for three and a half, four years, 150 flights later. Um, save it for the book. <laughs> so look, the internet is really your friends, guys. I mean, I, I, I really encourage this for any um, universities and that. Really teach your students just how to look for people. Find the experts, befriend them, sleep on their couches, have a beer with them. Honestly, it's the way to do it. So why is importance of encapsulating culture so important? We have environmental degradation on a scale we've never seen before due to global warming and climate change. We're seeing the sixth Holocene extinction. You know, this is since the planet begun, guys. Acts of God, fire, floods, political unrest, war. These are all factors. We are losing culture at a rapid rate. Uh, ironically, I was asked, I was propositioned by the BBC two years ago to um, go and go through some ISIS tunnels, because apparently the ISIS terrorists, war, war fighters, I don't know what they call them, um, had discovered Assyrian treasures. And so I think it's the only case where I've seen war actually benefit cultural preservation. It's, a, you know, it's one of those weird outliers, one of those weird use cases, right? So Syria, Turkey... Brazil lost their national museum up in flames a year ago. Fire is a theme. And the reason why we need to provide these experiences to everyone is it's really simple. It, it, it goes along the lines of world peace, basically. Because good luck finding a well-traveled bigot, as I like to say. <laughs> to, live John, to be living John Malkovich, to be living in someone else's shoes. It, it gives you a sense of culture and identity. It makes you realise how similar we all really are. And I had my own biases being in New Zealand for 35 years of my life. I'd never travelled, right? And so I always thought, you know, when I was asked to go to Iraq, I always thought that Arabic was going to be harsh and angry sounding because of the media and the way it was portrayed. Honestly, I got there. It was like Portuguese. 
It was phenomenal. Fathers and, fathers and mothers just raising and loving their sons and daughters. Everyone just living day by day. Blew my mind. And then, look, we need to make accessibility for everyone. And this is very close to heart. The disabled, the elderly. You know, hospice care, people who might not see the last great wonders of the world. You know, we can give this to them now. But it's also inaccessibility. Many of these sites you just can't get to anymore. Or they require very skilled teams like ourselves to get in there and give it to the rest of you. But as it relates to me, I'm, I'm legally blind by definition of the New Zealand government. 5% in one eye, 2.5 another. And it does make me laugh that they let me into these places. I remember dealing with, like, King Tut's jandals, and I'm like, please, guys, don't move a thing. Well, five security guard type, I don't know what they call them, like, uh, security, military police are holding AK-47s around me. I hadn't even seen a single gun in my life at this point. And, uh, yeah, so that was kind of a, an experience. But also the visual aids that this provides me personally. So when I was doing Queen Nefertari and, and in this location, I could never actually appreciate the hieroglyphs. You know, I can't see a meter in front of my face. And so when I actually got it into the VR, I was able to get up close and personal, genuinely, genuinely intimate. And that is, it is a weird thing to be able to have a better experience in VR than it is in the real life for myself. We like to think of these as teasers to the movie, you know? We find that these experiences actually encourage tourism. They don't digress from it. And also, the fact is, many of these sites are going to be gone or locked up soon, and people won't be able to see them. Notre Dame is a fine example of this. We will provide the means for them to experience this over the next five years. And so, the history books really are the history books of the future, is what we're basically in the business of. I love the fact that my daughter is going to be able to enjoy these experiences in social studies in years to come, and I love the fact, and it makes me very proud as a father, knowing that many of these experiences will be ours. Now, the problem is, who owns history? There's a big issue of bureaucracy of academia right now. I've travelled the world, and I've talked with many universities, and look, I'm not, I do not have a master's. I have a Bachelor of Recording Arts. I'm an audio engineer, guys. But there is a there's a bit of a bias going on. It's a bit closed. And a lot of waste and a lot of time, there's no sense of urgency in these, uh, in these entities. But the bigger culprits, guys, really, they're the corporations. They're doing what is, could be only said as a digital land grab right now. And it's quite disturbing. They're hoarding massive amounts of data under fake pretense saying that they are going to provide this data to the public to, for people like myself to do things with it. They're providing us low-resolution JPEGs when we need the high-resolution raw photography. You can Google them. And so we believe we are on the right side of history in this. Uh, my unique situation allowed us to have a fundamentally strong way of this because it was a passion project. So, machine learning to the rescue. Woot! Mundane tasks take us, so with Queen Nefertari, for an example, or any one of our experiences, it takes three guys, six weeks, and about $20,000 to produce one of these experiences, which is actually considerably cheaper than any other competition and considerably faster. But we can't do it at this pace. We need to find better ways. You know, I refer to the tasks as pushing pixels. It's exhausting. But luckily, we're an R&D company. Uh, and so when deep learning, machine learning, came to be a thing, we already had all the computing power, we already had all the resources we required, but most importantly, we had plenty of data. We had tens of, you know, hundreds of thousands of photographs that we could use to train the system. And so why not teach the computer to do these boring tasks? One of these tasks is uh, what we call contextually intelligent interpretation in painting. Basically, we're able to go and lasso around something we don't want in one of these scenes. Once again, with Nefertari, we had wooden floorboards, we had no smoking signs, we had plaques, we had halogen lighting. Circle around, and the computer knows how to fill it in with something that is contextually, artistically correct. Uh, other reasons why this is so useful is, quite frankly, because uh, where we get occlusion issues in our photogrammetry, where we don't take enough photographs, this is able to look at those low-density areas and fill it in artistically as good as any human could do it, if not better. Semantic image segmentation. 
This is the ability for us to essentially optimize and divide our meshes, um, divide our environments to work faster on machines, and also tag them with basic principles, like wooden floors have these properties. Uh, carpet has these properties. And this is where it gets really cool for audio. Instead of someone having to manually go in and label each one of these objects with certain properties, we can now have it done automatically. And so this creates way better immersive experiences for audio because things reflect sound the way you'd expect them to reflect. Noise removal. Now this is, just, this is like magic. There's your image. There's what we get. That's your base truth. And so we've been able to look at why this is useful is not all photographs are equal, right? And so we basically have a situation where we can enhance greatly. And so how do we use this? We can resurrect archival footage. We can resurrect stuff that did not, was never intended for photogrammetry. And so uh, I was actually recently asked by Time Magazine and my good friend Peter Martin, we were in the running, to do Martin Luther King's I Had a Dream speech. Use all that old archival footage and see if we can bring it back to life. Uh, sadly, I don't live in LA, though, so they gave it to Digital Domain. Lovely guys, though. Um, but Christchurch Cathedral, that's something that we really have been actively looking at. So we're looking at all the old footage, all the old wedding photos. We did a big call to action about a year ago, trying to archive as much data as we can to see if we can recreate the church in its, in its glory, in its beauty. Uh, DPBR is our most immediate and this is like live now. We have an early alpha that uh, people can try out. This technology is able to look at a photograph and extrapolate it to its true fundamentals. Sorry, guys. Uh, extrapolate it to its true fundamentals. Uh, what that means is we can remove harsh lighting, we can move highlights. Um, it does a whole bunch of other techniques like super sampling and noise removal as well. But where it is really good is that with photogrammetry, when we go to these environments, we have baked lighting depending on where the sun is. You know, and you don't want that, if you want to be able to relight an environment, you need to remove it all. And this is a massive deal for the photogrammetry community. But we also were able to create byproducts of this. So we can, a single person can now take a photo and essentially produce all the texture maps they need for any VFX package or game engine of their choice. And this is incredible. So an individual, one guy, can actually do more now than what a team of 30 could do in three months. So, uh, I might get a lot of hate mail soon. Because <laughs> it is extremely disruptive, disruptive to the VFX industry. You're talking about one-seventh to one-eighth of the VFX industry essentially having to find some other kind of work going on if this goes mainstream. Which is a little scary. But nature of deep learning, guys. So the need for economies of scale. We have an arsenal of tools. We have mass automation. We, this allows us to have economies of scale and reduce costs dramatically. So we can do more. Now, I can't be everywhere. <laughs> okay, as much as I like flying, I actually hate flying, but as much as I like traveling, um, we need people on the ground to actually acquisition the starter. But we need to create incentives to allow them to want to do this. And so we're saying, let's introduce an artist rights management system where that photograph is, you know, is basically secured by a digital ledger. So where that photograph, that individual is tagged, they can say what that photograph is used for and what use cases. Um, so it's, think of it like Creative Commons and the different level of Creative Commons. But more importantly, we don't want people scanning the dyes and putting stripper poles in there. So we need to make this uh, basically work for everyone and not cross any lines, basically. And also the artist needs to get paid royalties. This is important. So. For now, philanthropic entities, we believe in the short term, can jump in and fund many of these endeavours, very similar how we did to Antarctica, these great expeditions of the world, of past centuries gone. And these parties were, you know, they're mentioned in the history books. We know, we know who the heroes were who went to these places, and we know the people who bankrolled it. There's nothing wrong with that. Licensing to institutes, universities, schools, educational facilities, the museology scene, museums. They are dying. They, they are craving for these kind of experiences. And right now they're ha having to spend hundreds of thousands of doing it for themselves, and it's usually closed off. We don't want that. We want everyone to be able to experience this. Now, the exciting thing that um, I spend a lot of time in LA, uh, what film studios are doing now with real-time virtualization, where they're shooting everything on green screen now, and they're going out and getting these photogrammetry environments and placing people in them. We're saying, look, instead of you sending a team of 20 to do it, license that environment through us, and we'll provide you at a fraction of the cost. 
So, we have a decentralized backup peer-to-peer. -peer. None of these photos stay in one place. It's encrypted, but it's distributed. And we have a marketplace that benefits everyone. So, the conclusion, guys. An army of millions running around taking these photographs, acquisitioning this data. A decentralized, secure database that protects this data. Computing power and AI, deep learning, making this an automated process. And we, as a result, get mass real-world encapsulations for everyone. And this is how we're going to back up the planet. Thank you. Dr. Simon.